Well, Queensland are up to Darwin, right across the top end, the red tailed black cockatoos are really successful and you can see them in not huge flocks but reasonably large flocks and you can see just the way they fly around, they have this beautiful cruisy way of flying, so they have such big wings, they make it look very, very easy, so they're a beautiful species. Now unfortunately here in Victoria, the red tailed black cockatoos are a threatened species, they're only found in far western Victoria, so over towards the South Australian border. We only have about a thousand of these birds left. Now being such big birds, they need very large territories and also very large habitat. So big old trees to nest in to survive. And that's what can make it a bit hard for these birds in the wild they do lose their habitat. Now so they're a pretty special species to see in Victoria in the wild. We are going to meet some other birds throughout our show that you might have seen before. There are quite a few parrot species that are very successful. And so they are going really well in large numbers. Now some of our parrots of course are very loud as well. Some species that you might see walking around the sanctuary, like a sulfur crested cockatoo, just like this one here. One bird calls at about 135 decibels. Well done, Cosy. This is Cosy, by the way. You see that beautiful crest on the top of the head. So a sulfur crested cockatoo. So one of these birds calls at about 135 decibels, and a jet engine is 140 decibels. Okay, so they are unbelievably loud. If you put a flock of them together, as you can imagine, it is really deafening. So these guys, you'll usually hear them before you see them in the wild. So they're also very successful, very beautiful parrot species as well. Now, as well as meeting parrots today, we also want you to meet some other birds. So you're going to meet some really cool birds of prey. Now, generally speaking, parrots are vegetarians, they're eating fruits and nuts and seeds. But we also want you to meet some of our predatory birds, some of our birds of prey, which we call raptors. And the first raptor we're going to meet today is Australia's third largest raptor. It's a bird that's found, normally found up through the hot, dry environments of central Australia, so not really found here in Victoria at all. When she makes her way out, I want you to have a look, first of all, at her wing shape. The first bird we're going to meet is a black-breasted buzzard. To make that even harder on me, this black-breasted buzzard's name is Beatrice the black-breasted buzzard. It is a little bit of a tongue twister, so I'm not going to say it over and over again. But when she makes her way out, I want you to have a look at those wings. You know, she actually has really quite large, broad wings, and she actually has quite a relatively light body weight. She actually weighs under, under a kilo and a half. Here she is. So when she flies again, you can see those big, broad wings. They're what we call broad-winged raptors, and they're adapted for a very energy-efficient way of flying. Those broad, big, broad wings, compared to that light body, means they can simply get up, and let the air move them around. They can put those wings out and just glide and soar effortlessly without using up very much energy at all and cover extremely large distances to be able to find enough food to survive. Now, if they're not up nice and high soaring around, it is quite possible to see black breasted buttons down on the ground. And while Beatrice is out here, she'll show you that she's actually quite comfortable and coordinated while she's on the ground. What they're doing on the ground is actually hunting. They're one of the few raptors in Australia that do some of their hunting it's on the ground. Smacking. What they're looking for it's is the eggs and nestlings of our large ground nesting birds, which includes our largest bird of all here in Australia, which hopefully you've all seen already. Hopefully you've already seen the emus today. Wow. And you've worked out that emus are really big birds. Now, because they're really big birds, they lay really big eggs. In fact, the egg of an emu is too big for a bird like Beatrice to be able to pick that egg up in their feet or their beak to try and break it open. So they've developed this really special behaviour to get into emu eggs, which I'm hoping Beatrice here is going to be able to show us how to do that, because I just happen to have an emu egg in my pocket. As you can see, that's a big egg. Now, she can't break it with her feet or her beak. She ought, sorry, sweetie, I was too slow for you, wasn't I? We're just going to let Beatrice make her way home if she wants to go home, and then we'll ask her to come back out and finish the job. And this time I'll try and be a little bit quicker for her, so she can show you exactly how to break open an egg. Now, I might have mentioned that this is not actually a real emu egg. Oh, yeah. This one's a pretend one, but it's the same size as a real emu egg. Really, really big egg. In fact, the egg the size of this would last the black breasted buzzer three or four days worth of food. Incredibly good food source for them. And they're one of the very few animals out there to actually break open, break an, an emu egg open. And I'm hoping, Beatrice, would you like to come back out and say hello again? <laughs> so I'll just explain that behaviour. We've actually taught our black breasted buzzards, or all our birds actually, they have choice and control over their days. If they don't want to be out here, if they want to go home for any reasons, they might have seen something. Thanks for joining us in. They might see something out here that we don't see and they don't want to be out here. They're always welcome to go home. So every time she lands on that perch, then that door will always open. No matter when, when that is, they will always open and she has the opportunity to go home if she wants to. Now, she knows I've got something to help her break that egg open. It's called a rock. I'm going to put the rock on the ground. She's going to go and pick that rock up and watch what oh. she does. She picks it up. Come around. It's over here. 
<laughs> she takes it down to the egg, lines the egg up, oh. and and throws it down on top of it. Oh, How cool is that? that oh, you missed it, you missed it, sweetie, over there. That is a pretty cool behaviour. It's one of the coolest behaviours you'll ever get a chance to see, I reckon. One of the interesting things about that is the fact that it's not a learnt behaviour. People often think it's a behaviour that we've had to teach her how to do. We didn't teach her how to do it. She didn't learn how to do it from her parents. She just knew how to do it. All black-breasted buzzards just know how to break open in your eggs. Very first time they ever see one, they know exactly what they have to do. It's called an instinctive or an innate behaviour. So I've not learned it anyway. So it's quite amazing simply because of that. It's also pretty interesting. There's only one other bird in the whole world that has that same technique to get into a food source. It's a bird found in northern Africa. It's called the Egyptian Aye. vulture. Aye. It breaks open ostrich eggs in exactly Aye. the same way. So I think we're pretty lucky having the black-breasted buzzards living here in Australia. Now the next bird that we want you to meet today, if you're hoping to see one in the wild, you need to leave Hills or Sanctuary, hop on an aeroplane and fly many hours to the north. You need to go all the way to our tropical rainforest up in far north Queensland. This is an eclectus parrot. His name is Les, and this is a species that's found up the top of some very big trees. In fact, these birds would rarely come to the ground at all. So Les looks to live his life in the top of big rainforest trees, where as you can see, he's really green across the black. But underneath his wings, you might have seen there, he's got these bright red patches, a little bit of blue on there as well. So very handsome boy. These guys are a pretty special species because with a lot of birds, the boys and the girls look the same. All the boys are brightly coloured and the girls are sort of plain greys and browns. But the collectors parrots, they're both absolutely stunning. So this is a male. The females are actually red and blue all over their body and have an almost black beak. They look like a completely different species because they have really different jobs to do in the wild. Now, as I mentioned, the boys spend much of their time in the very tops of rainforest trees. They're collecting fruits and nuts throughout the day. So, of course, if you're looking down at Les from above, it's really hard to spot. So he's well camouflaged in the tops of the trees. The girls are red and blue, and they spend most of their time, nine or ten months of the year, they're lower down in those trees. They're actually defending their nest in the hollow from other female collectors' parrots. So they're not going out to find their own food, so it's up to the boys to provide it. And that's actually how the boys compete with each other. It's not by being the most brightly coloured male, it's by being the boy who can provide the most food and the best food for the female. Wow. If you're a male collectors' parrot like Les, then you can actually be popping around to see three or four girls throughout the day. Now, obviously the birds we're meeting today are trained to participate in our presentations and here at Zoos Victoria, the zookeeper's job, a lot of that time is spent training animals. And we train animals for all sorts of different reasons. We train them for exercise, environmental enrichment, but one of the ones we want you to have a look at today is the training we do to help our animals participate in their own health care. It's actually a really important part of their day. You can imagine having a, an animal that volunteers to participate in medical treatments and things like that actually makes it much easier for the animals themselves, makes it much easier for zookeepers and it makes it much easier for vets as well. So it's actually a win-win all round. Now some of our animals we have here at Zoo Victoria unfortunately are animals that have been found out in the wild that have been injured or orphaned and can't be released back out into the wild. The next bird we're going to meet is one of those birds. The next bird was found on the side of the road about 15 years ago with a broken wing. His name is Kevin. He's a long-billed corella. When he came into us, the vets checked him out, made sure his wing was okay, fixed it all up, but determined he wasn't suitable to go back out in the wild. So he's been a member of the Spirits of the, Spirits of the Sky team for the last 15 years. In fact, in his mind, he's been the star of the Spirits of the Sky show for 15 years. We let him think that, that's all right. But today I want Kevin to help show you some of the behaviours that we have to help him participate in his own health care. Particularly when he first came down after that broken wing, we obviously needed to make sure that that wing was working properly, it was extending properly, and that all the feathers were nice and healthy on the wing as well. So one of the first things we asked Kevin to do is simply open his wings, and we can check out those wings and make sure the wings extend properly and they're nice and balanced between the left and the right. We also asked Kevin to turn around so we can check all those different feathers. We also make sure that the feet and the ankles and everything are working as well. The feet are another really important one with captive birds. We need to make sure their feet are nice and healthy. So we've asked Kevin to be able to show us his feet individually. So Kevin can show us his right foot and his left foot. Which is a really useful behaviour. The other behaviour I want to show you today looks like a really simple behaviour. And it's a pretty simple behaviour, but it's actually a very, very important behaviour for a lot of different reasons. What we ask all our birds to be able to do is simply step up. Now that stepping up is really important because that's the first step for them to be able to tell us whether they're prepared to work or not. I mentioned a little bit before with our black breasted buzzard Beatrice there that she has choice and control whether she wants to participate or not. That's the first step. We can ask our birds to step up. If they say no, then we know it's, they're not ready to work. 
We can simply come back a little bit later on, we try it again. It's a little bit like you waking up in the morning and someone coming in and saying, hey, would you like to go to work today? You simply say no. You still get paid exactly the same amount, but you just say no. I don't like that, I reckon that huh. we, should, we should enforce that one. But it's a really good way for our birds and all the other animals to be able to say yes or no, I'm ready to work. We can come back, when they step up on the hand, we know they're ready to go. So it's a really easy way of giving them some choice and control in what they're doing. It also allows us to move them around if we need to quite easily. And it also allows us to ask them to step down, which means we can ask them to step onto all sorts of different things, including something like a set of scales so we can weigh them and we can monitor their health simply through their weight, which is a really useful tool for us to have. Now, Kevin, as I said before, Kevin does think he's the star of the show, so he does expect a little bit of a round of applause before he heads off. Kevin, that's your cue, thanks, mate. Good job today. Now, they're just a few of the very simple behaviours that we have some of our birds do, but right across Zoos Victoria, the four different properties we have here at Zoos Victoria, we train for all sorts of different things. In fact, here in uh, Hillsville, some of the things that we're training, we have our Dingoes that voluntarily participate in vaccination, so they volunteer to come in, have an injection for their vaccination, and move off again. We have a quoll that's actually trained to voluntarily participate in having his heart rate monitored, so we can check that his health is, all, is, is good as well. So all these behaviours allow us to provide much better welfare for all our animals. So it's a really, really beneficial thing for the animals and for us as well. Now, the next bird we're going to have a look at is one of our nocturnal birds of prey. I hope we'll get a nice close look at this one. Now we have seen some very beautiful, brightly coloured parrot species already in our show today. This is a bird that's not very colourful and that's by design, okay? She wants to be able to hide in amongst the trees, sit there and then just emerge. When it's time to attack, then that's when she appears. This is Millie. Millie is a barking owl. That's a pretty special owl species here in Victoria. And so these birds would look to be hiding in amongst the trees during the day. And if something goes past, they will happily hunt during the day. They're looking for possums and gliders and other birds, really anything that moves if it's a good small size. And so they are typically hunting through the trees. So for those possums and, and gliders are typically their targets. And you can see that Millie can fly pretty well during the day. Some people wonder about owls flying during the day. They see just as well during the day as they do at night time. They just don't see in colour. So Millie is seeing everything out here in black and white, but these birds still see in greater detail and at a greater distance than any of us as well. In fact, they see it about 35 times better than any of us, okay? So, Millie has amazing eyesight. You can just see her too, just flicking her head around. So she's scanning while she's out here. These birds also use their hearing, all right? Now, we know that owls have got great eyesight. They also have unbelievable hearing. So one ear is higher up on Millie's head than the other one. So it means that she can hear left and right, but she can also hear up and down at the same time. So that's really handy. So if it was so dark that she couldn't see anything, she could actually locate her prey just by using her hearing. So it's really, really handy. And so the only problem is though when it gets windy, it makes it hard to hear things. So you'll just see Millie just flicking her head around while she's out here today. So she's just scanning her territory, making sure she's got it all to herself. And so you guys don't need to worry too much. These birds, as you can tell, are pretty good at flying around. So typically, so Millie would be emerging out of the trees. Now what these birds are able to do is to fly through the trees. So they're able to time their wing beats so they're not hitting branches as they're coming through. Millie doesn't really need to demonstrate that today. She's just going to prove it by not crashing into any of us. Okay, so she is very good. You guys are her trees today. So you can just see there, she is turning her head around. Now these birds actually have twice as much neck as we do. So we've all got seven, well I hope you've got seven bones in your neck. I know I do. And Millie's actually got 14. So she can turn that head in either direction through an arc of 270 degrees. So it means they can sit nice and still, not give away where they're hiding. They just flick that head round, <laughs> locate their prey, and then they fly down and grab it. And of course, Millie is a raptor, just like the buzzard you saw before. So she has very powerful feet and big claws on her toes, which are called talons. And that's what these birds use to catch and kill their prey. Then once she's caught her prey, she'll seize it with those feet and then rip it apart with her feet. So they have a very powerful, narrow beak. And so that's what they've used to <laughs> rip things into smaller pieces and swallow them. So they're great hunters. Now again, across Northern Australia, these birds are going quite well. Here in Victoria, a bit like our red-tailed black or two we saw before, here in Victoria, these birds are actually a threatened species. We only have about 50 or 60 pairs of beautiful barking owls still breeding here in Victoria. So they're not going 